Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. A First Nations woman's legal battle over her right to run for council while living outside of her First Nations settlement lands in Yukon is now over. Cindy Dixon has been fighting the case at every level of the court system since 2019. Today, a decision was released by Canada's highest court. Here's Sarah Connors with more. The Supreme Court of Canada has upheld the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nations requirement that elected officials must reside in the community. The First Nation requires all elected officials to live in the community of Old Crow or move there in 14 days. Vuntut citizen Cindy Dixon ran for council in 2018, but she was barred from running because she lives in Whitehorse, 800 kilometers away. She took the matter to court, arguing her equality rights are guaranteed in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Vuntut Gwich'in argued as a self-governing First Nation, it has its own constitution and the charter doesn't apply to them and it had a right to govern itself in order to preserve its culture and traditions. The Supreme Court ultimately found the Charter does apply to the First Nation, but it also found the First Nation's residency requirement infringed upon Dixon's right to equality. However, Dixon lost because the court found Section 25 of the Charter, which upholds the collective rights of Indigenous people, ultimately prevails over an individual's equality rights. Chief Pauline Frost welcomes the decision. It's our, always our intention to protect Aboriginal rights and treaty rights and inherent rights of our community. And we are a self-governing Indigenous community. And our seat of our government is on our settlement area. It always has been historically. She hopes the outcome doesn't dissuade other citizens from running in the future. We will do our utmost to ensure that they're relocated in, a, in due course and that they're supported when they relocate and that we find them appropriate accommodations, that we don't want this to ever be seen as a restrictive process. Dixon's lawyer said in a statement they're pleased the court confirmed Batanguijin people have charter rights in relation to their Indigenous government, among other things. However, they're disappointed with the result. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Meanwhile, a federal court is ordering Ottawa to make changes to a self-government deal with the Métis Nation of Alberta. The agreement was signed between the MNA and the federal government in 2019. It is part of proposed legislation, which includes the MNA and the Métis Nations of Saskatchewan and Ontario. C53, Bill C-53 is currently at the committee stage in Parliament. However, Justice Sebastian Grimond says the deal with the MNA is too broad. And made without consultation with the Métis Settlements General Council, and the Fort Mackay Métis Nation in Alberta. Justice Grimond's decision says Ottawa needs to go back to the table and consult with these groups. Residents have a lot to say when it comes to how the city of Yellowknife handled the 2023 wildfire evacuation. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs attended last night's public engagement session and has more. The Yellowknife Multiplex is empty now, but in a matter of minutes, 200 people filled these chairs. They were there to listen and share opinions about the 2023's unprecedented wildfire season, which led to the evacuation of multiple communities, including the 20,000-person territorial capital of Yellowknife. Media was not allowed to film the public engagement session, but it is part of an independent response review led by KPMG, a global accounting firm contracted by the city. They heard feedback about mitigation and preparedness, evacuation response, re-entry and recovery. A big theme was poor communication. Government told residents up until the last minute they would just shelter in place and wouldn't have to evacuate. Everybody that spoke up there today, their biggest concern was the lack of communication on all levels of government, all levels of evacuation, right from leaving to returning to the evacuees. Like for me staying here and working, I knew what communication I had within the volunteer group. But then you hear from the people that were down south that were in different evacuation centers what the struggles went through that. Not everyone left during evacuation. Scott Uli was one of 150 volunteers who stayed behind. Volunteers helped fire smart. They fed firefighters, checked on residents' dwellings, and assisted contractors helping to defend the city. 
Folks also express frustration in the government's lack of wildfire defenses, not investing in fire breaks and sprinklers until the fire was at their doorsteps. Many spoke of disparities in their experiences during evacuation. Elders and young families who left by plane were subjected to long lineups, which lasted hours, if not days. Some stayed in hotels, while others slept in evacuation centres peppered across Alberta, relying on meal vouchers. To have yeah. a disaster planning in place. They could have used the Red Cross from the beginning. I spoke on the homelessness because we had over 369 homeless. When they were evacuated, they were dispersed in different cities. Cleet resident Georgina Frankie says she hopes the review highlights how vulnerable populations were left out of planning some of whom never did make it back to Yellowknife after evacuation. There's 20,000 people. Why do we have over 300 Indigenous homeless? The city says they hope to apply lessons learned from last year into their plans for this wildfire season. The report will be released publicly in June. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. The Yukon Child and Youth Advocate Office and the Yukon First Nation Education Directorate are launching a review of systemic discrimination and racism in the territory's education system. Advocates say the review will take a closer look at how systemic racism impacts Indigenous students and other students of colour. The organizations involved will be speaking directly with students and families in the coming months as well as conducting an online survey. The review is expected to be completed this coming December. A report detailing students' experiences will be made public next year. The executive director for Yukon First Nation Education says the findings will be used to help shape a better education system. The systems, policies, the processes, procedures and legislation um, perpetuate systemic racism. And it's, you know, for our Indigenous children, uh, we have to have those conversations and we have to figure out from them what we can do uh, to change that system. Time to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, we'll hear from one of the plaintiffs in that half a billion dollar child welfare settlement in Manitoba. And our Truth in Politics panel will be here to weigh in on it as well. Welcome back. Manitoba settled three class action lawsuits this week worth $530 million. They have agreed to repay upwards of 30,000 people who were in the child welfare system their children's special allowances. The federal money was clawed back by the province over a 14-year period to the tune of about $300 million. The CSAs are meant to help kids in care at the same level as support as other children receiving family allowance benefits. At any given time in Manitoba, there are roughly 10,000 children in care. 80 to 90 percent are Indigenous. To be eligible, you must have been a provincially funded child in care between 2005 and 2019. The settlement goes for approval by the courts on June 14th followed by a 30-day 30 30-day 30 appeal process. Uh, uh, Flett, one of the uh, plaintiffs, is hopeful. A distribution plan is in place by September. She says kids who are currently in care and eligible could see funds deposited in their accounts as early as this fall. She also says legal costs will come out of interest gained on the money. You know, it's a significant amount of money, right? Like it's over half a billion dollars. So when the money comes in 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 july i guess it would be when the appeal period is over um just investing that i mean we've had the calculations done at a conservative gic interest rate um you know it would generate around nine hundred thousand dollars a month in interest so it will it will add to the fund and that income will pay any legal costs as well as the cost of administration and anything that is left in the fund when all that is done um, that is going to be a second round of distribution, so that is also going to go to the kids. For more on this settlement, we're joined by our Truth and Politics panel. 
Negan Sinclair is a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press. Jennifer Lewitz is a policy analyst with Warshield. Jennifer Negan, thanks for being with us. Uh, Negan, we'll start with you. It was the previous NDP government who started clawing back these special allowances in 2005. Uh, their rationale was we're looking after these kids so the Fed should pay us those allowances. Uh, what was wrong with that picture? Well, it tells you a few things. Uh, probably most, first and foremost is it really doesn't matter what political stripe the government is uh, when it comes to Indigenous kids. Uh, their needs are considered secondary and whether it be uh, elections that change those governments or uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it, it requires advocacy from those families, from Indigenous organizations to make sure they're fairly compensated. Uh, the faulty part of that logic is, is that kids are human beings and kids should be considered uh, in terms of all of their needs from their glasses to being able to attend sports programs. It's not these kids' fault that they've ended up in the child welfare system for whatever reason that might be. Uh, and so we have to consider that these kids, in order to be able to get to become the full rounded human beings that they are uh, and need to be, uh, they need to be considered in the ways in which uh, they need to be able to experience things that kids who are in more privileged circumstances experience. And so uh, it's a one-sided, quite one-dimensional, and frankly, borderline racist decision that the province made to treat these children as lesser than and simply say, well, you know, we need to keep the money. Jennifer, there's a similar suit uh, before the courts in Saskatchewan. Uh, what can you tell us about that one? Yeah, so it sounds like the government of Saskatchewan is being taken to court with a class action lawsuit. Um, the attorney general is named in that lawsuit as well, because it sounds like the benefits that the federal government through the um, the kids in care were being used to offset the provincial government's own obligations for child welfare. So rather than you know using their own revenue to pay for those child welfare obligations, they were using money that rightfully should have been going to Indigenous kids in care, which is a huge problem. You know, you, we're hearing that kids that hit 18 that are transitioning out of care are often, you know, on their own. There's not a lot of resources. There's not a lot of money. There's not a lot of help for them. And to find out that there was money, you know, dating back to the 1970s, how many adults now that are former kids in care are affected by these government policies that were discriminatory? And Negan, what's your understanding of what happens next here? Uh, when money could start flowing, who's all going to get it? So uh, just to echo what Jennifer said, uh, absolutely that these kids have to be considered. And, and this is a long decades and has many different uh, decades of impact. $530 million. Uh, this is a lawsuit for about 10,000 kids who have been in care and have been uh, had their allowances removed from them so that they the provincial government will keep them and then of course this is going across western canada so two things have to happen now the first is that the lawyers have to take their portion uh, which can be fairly significant and then the amount of monies are divided up amongst the 10,000 children that have been advocated for and perhaps those who are late to the party or those who are uh, added for whatever reason or dispute that they were not included in the first round of the lawsuit and so we're looking at probably anywhere between six months to two years to distribute the funds and then on top of that uh, the amount of monies that would be allocated probably in the neighborhood of between thirty and forty thousand dollars. Jennifer, what does this settlement, uh, all these other lawsuits that are going on with regard to the child welfare system, what does that say to you about the way Indigenous children are treated by the child welfare system? Uh, I think discrimination is the number one word that comes to mind. You know, we saw in Manitoba a couple of years ago there was a court ruling that said that in fact they did discriminate against Indigenous kids in care. I think the court system will be looking heavily at at that case um, when this is brought forward in Saskatchewan. And I think just, you know, not understanding the complexities of Indigenous kids in care and that discrimination component is huge. And I think now with Bill C-92, it's opening the floodgates to how Indigenous kids have been treated across the board. It wasn't just residential schools and 60 Scoop, but there were so many different components playing into the discrimination of kids in care, and we're now just hearing about it. Jennifer and Negan, we'll have to leave it there. Appreciate your time, as always, this week. We watch. Wolseley, Saskatchewan is trying to claim the next Kraft Hockeyville crown. Details on that and more after the break.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Chantel Lee stopped to capture the beauty on a windy early spring day along the coast of Rhode Island, south of the Medicine Line. Thanks for sharing, Chantel. This Easter weekend, be sure to send a picture to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, plus four in Halifax, seven with showers in Fredericton. Five in snow in Kuduak, zero with flurries in Nain. Nine above in Montreal, cloudy and zero in Val d'Or. Plus one with snow in Sault Ste. Marie, a cloudy high of three in North Bay. Five for Thunder Bay, sun's out and three above in Sioux Lookout. Zero and sunny in God's Lake, plus two for Norway House. Plus one and snow in Winnipeg, flurries and minus one in Dauphin. Plus one with snow in Regina, flurries and minus one in Saskatoon. Minus three with snow in Meadow Lake and Buffalo Narrows. In northern Alberta, sunny and minus four for Fort Chip, minus one in high level. Minus two in Edmonton, cloudy and three below in Lethbridge. Thirteen and showers in Vancouver and Kamloops. Sunny and three above in Prince George. Sun's out and eight in Smithers. Minus one in Old Crow, plus seven for Whitehorse. Minus seven in Yellowknife, minus five in Norman Wells. 20 below in Saks Harbor, minus 15 for Fallatuck. Minus 13 in Chesterfield, 14 below in Whale Cove. Minus 26 in Resolute and Joe Haven. Well, after a 12-year hiatus, the Indigenous hip-hop group Winnipeg's Most are returning to the stage. Sierra Benton sat down with the group in their studio. Local hip-hop legends, Winnipeg's Most, are gearing up for a reunion show in their hometown. MCs Tyler Rogers and Billy Pearson, better known as Charlie Feta and John C., are dedicating the concert to their late band member, Jamie Prefontaine, also known as Brooklyn. Prefontaine died in 2015. His family never publicly released the cause of his death. It'll be the first time the band has performed together since 2012. Having that time um, since the since we broke up and whatever to you know kind of heal and grow and just kind of really look back on the legacy and see what we did and it just felt like the right time in my opinion. The group took off in 2010 after releasing their debut self-titled album mixed by Juno-nominated producer Stomp. Soon, they began topping local hip-hop charts. In just two years, they scored nine Aboriginal People's Choice Music Awards. Uh, recorded the first album in my dining room. Uh, <laughs> yeah, didn't, didn't hear it for like, you know, we recorded it in about two weeks. Uh, Stomp left with it, everything. We didn't have any demos, we had nothing. And we definitely, definitely never thought that uh, it was going to be taken the way it was or, or we, like, we certainly never planned that. But I mean, like, we planned to make music, we planned to put our music out and we planned to have our voices heard and to have, them, ha to have it heard on those scales was just uh, overwhelming. The group disbanded in 2013 after Pearson faced drug possession charges. Since then, Pearson and Rogers say they've grown a lot. When asked what advice they'd give young Indigenous musicians, their message was clear, just put yourself out there. If they're creating it in their house, they're creating it in studios, they're creating it at their buddy's house, is to always just put it out, just put it out there. Reflecting on Winnipeg's most early days, Rogers says despite the controversies and violence that seemed to follow them around, they always stayed true to their word. It was unapologetic. We we didn't hide. We didn't sugarcoat. No, you know, not every song was super political or anything. But we, on the songs that we did explore those darker sides of our lives, we were openly honest, brutally honest. Winnipeg's most takes the Burton Cumming Theatre stage on Thursday at 7 p.m. Central. Sierra Benton's APTN National News, Winnipeg. A small town in Saskatchewan has a chance to make history as the first community in the province to win Craft Hockeyville. With $250,000 and an NHL game on the line, they are relying on community support to help save the hometown rink. Our reporter Rachel May tells us why this small town thinks it can make it big. 
With a population of just over 800 people, Wolseley, Saskatchewan is attempting to bring an NHL game to the community and save their aging rink. Vance Weber is one of the Wolseley Craft Hockeyville organizers. The big reason is our ice plant uh, is on year 44 of a 25 year design. If Wolseley wins, they'll receive a quarter of a million dollars to upgrade the rink and replace the artificial ice plant. Despite their ice plant being on its last legs, the rink is home to eight surrounding communities and three different First Nations. Goalie for the U15 Wolseley Mustangs, Regan Stevenson, drives with his dad from Cowessis to play in Wolseley. He says not knowing how the ice will be is tough. It's kind of tough. Can't play that much. Harder to play. Regan's dad, Corey, says the rink is vital for youth, both in Wolseley and the surrounding communities. They need a place to go, to play, to skate, figure skate, any kind of thing, any act activity. The Wolseley rink has also been home to success. Riel Thompson started his 20-year hockey career in Wolseley, peaking with the Prince Albert Raiders of the WHL. Thompson is from Carry the Kettle First Nation and says rinks like Wolseley help all youth build their confidence on the ice. It's a good program for for uh, a wide array of, of, of many different youth, you know, and especially First Nation youth as well. Wolseley is facing Elliott Lake, Ontario, Cochrane, Alberta, and Enderby, British Columbia in the final four. The public can begin voting tomorrow, March 29th at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, and voting closes March 30th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Rachel May, APTN National News, Saskatoon. Time now to head over to our Ottawa studio where Fraser Needham is standing by with a look at tonight's episode of APTN's Political Show. Coming up after the news, major news out of Ottawa today, the Supreme Court of Canada has upheld a law of a Yukon First Nation which requires band members to live in the remote community if they want to serve on council. We'll talk to APTN reporter Daniel Parody about the decision. Senator Yvonne Boyer is also here to tell us about her private member's bill which would stiffen the criminal code penalties on doctors who perform sterilizations without the consent of patients. And Saskatoon Star Phoenix columnist Doug Cutan joins us to talk about what is making headlines on the prairies. All this and more ahead. You can catch Nation to Nation right here in roughly one minute from now. Also a reminder to tune in to the second last of the Hockey Night in Canada in Cree games. That's taking place Saturday night right here. The Carolina Hurricanes will be in Montreal to take on the Habs. You can watch it all go down in Plains Cree starting at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I believe that's also uh, during that game, the Kraft Hockeyville winner will be announced. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday before the Good Friday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Merci, miigwech. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy your long weekend.